Energy Flow and Ecosystems. Today we're going to take a look at uh, food chains, food webs, food pyramids, uh, terms like producer, consumer, predator, decomposer, and symbiosis. So first we need to take a look at some other terms so we can understand what we might find in the ecosystem. First term is biomass. And biomass is the total amount of living plants, animals, fungi, and bacteria in a given area. Uh, it can really vary from area to area. It's measured in kilograms per square meter. So if we take a look at a tropical rainforest, you'll see lots of living matter. We would say there's a lot of biomass here. In kilograms per square meter, it would probably be a very high number. If we take a look at the tundra, we see there's a lot of rock and there is some vegetation, some plants, but relative to the tropical rainforest, it would have an awful lot less biomass. So the amount of kilograms per square meter of biomass would be much lower. Another idea we want to look at is energy flow. Energy flows through the ecosystem uh, and it flows from uh, things like the sun, to living organisms and then from one organism to another. So we have a very simple graphic here that shows that and ultimately what this shows us is that pretty much all energy uh, that living things use with a few exceptions uh, comes from the sun. Okay, so sunlight is our starting point. And when photosynthesis happens, that's a plant's way of converting light energy into chemical energy and the chemical that it converts it to is glucose, sort of the universal energy currency in living things. Now the plant can use that glucose uh, as energy for anything uh, from growth to uh, chemical reactions and that's that's pretty much it for plants. Plants don't move around a whole lot. Uh, but if the plants are consumed, that glucose is also going to be used for other activities um, by other living things like uh, moving around, staying warm, and reproduction, hunting, all those types of things. And the way that both plants and animals use the glucose is through a process called cellular respiration which is shown right here. Okay, um, Very simple organisms can do the first part of cellular respiration which is the conversion of glucose into a molecule called pyruvate and get very very small amounts of energy. More complex organisms like ourselves basically do all of the aerobic cellular respiration that means in the presence of oxygen and produce lots of energy and the name of that uh, molecule that carries the energy is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So we're still converting uh, energy. We initially converted it from light energy into chemical energy and through cellular respiration we're actually converting the chemical energy to other chemical energy because ATP is also chemical energy. It's just that ATP is the form of energy or, or the chemical that cells can use for energy, uh, sort of all living things would use the ATP for, for uh, energy. Uh, it's very hard to use glucose because it's a sort of a larger molecule and sometimes you need just little bits of energy and that's sort of the benefit of the ATP. Okay, uh, another term that we need to talk about is producers and producers are basically plants or any organism like algae or some bacteria that can do photosynthesis and they produce carbohydrates. So this kind of rides on the coattails of the previous slide where we take sunlight and we convert it into carbohydrates, specifically the carbohydrate glucose. Okay, and plants are like glucose making machines, they're energy converters, they convert sunlight into glucose. So along come the consumers and the consumers are the ones that are going to be doing a lot of cellular respiration. The plants also do cellular respiration whenever they need to convert that glucose to ATP. Plants uh, can make that glucose but the animals can't so they consume uh, the plant material and then they can do cellular respiration and convert the glucose into ATP which can be used for the cells in what we call cellular energy. So this would be cellular energy. 
Now there's another factor that's going on in the ecosystems and that's decomposing because things die uh, and when they die the the organic matter needs to be brought back to the environment so that it can be reused so decomposition or biodegradation is the breakdown of organic wastes and dead organisms and it's done mainly by bacteria and by fungi okay and you know there's sort of this famous idea that if there were no bacteria in the world uh, really the world would stop in terms of living things because uh, without the bacteria to break down the material so that they can be reused by other living things we'd sort of be swimming in a whole bunch of dead things and uh, there wouldn't be any life Okay, so we want to talk about food chains and food webs. Food chains uh, show the flow of energy from plant to animal and from animal to animal. Each step of the food chain is considered a trophic level. The first trophic level, whether you're looking at an aquatic or marine uh, food chain or a terrestrial or land food chain, the first level is always the producers okay so this is the first trophic level and we've got producers okay and they're simply the organisms that are doing photosynthesis or sometimes and this would just be sort of with ocean dwelling uh, bacteria they can also do something called chemosynthesis in photosynthesis they're taking the sun's energy and converting it to chemicals in chemosynthesis they're actually using minerals and other materials to uh, produce the glucose so two different but similar processes in the in the end you end up with some glucose okay organisms that feed on the producers are called primary consumers and they're considered to be the second trophic level okay. those organisms also get eaten by other organisms and this would be uh, considered the secondary consumers and we call this the uh, third trophic level now in this graphic it actually shows quite a few trophic levels but in reality uh, you can't get much further than the next level which is the tertiary uh, tro tertiary consumers or the third level consumers uh, because there just isn't enough energy in the system for that to happen so this would be the fourth trophic level and you'd have something like this happening on land you know maybe the the grass gets eaten by the insects they get eaten by other insects which get eaten by amphibians like frogs and probably a bunch of other organisms as well the frogs in turn are going to get eaten maybe by the snakes um, the snake would get eaten by the um, hawk up here but the hawk might actually be able to eat both of these um, so this is a little bit misleading because it makes it look like there are multiple levels they usually are not five trophic levels they usually uh, or actually this shows six trophic levels usually there's only about four trophic levels webs most organisms are part of many food chains and food webs show this here's an example of a food web it's sort of just uh, a few food chains put together uh, in this example we would have some primary producers like the vegetation all the plants all the submerged aquatic vegetation the phytoplankton which simply means little organisms that float around in the water and can do photosynthesis and then anything that feeds on them would be considered primary consumers okay we've got quite a few primary consumers okay you can see a few more here small planktivorous fish they eat plankton okay the next level would be the secondary consumers and the secondary consumers would eat the animals that eat the plants so we've got some examples here okay and then we've got the top consumers which are usually considered to be very predatory and they'll eat uh, any of the secondary consumers they might actually even eat the primary consumers um, they're 
is at least one example on here of an omnivore. Any of the animals that eat animals are considered to be carnivores. So this bald eagle would be a carnivore and so would the osprey. Uh, but there are some uh, animals that eat plants and those would be herbivores and an example of a herbivore would be any of these primary consumers like the geese and the swans and the ducks and um, the small planktivorous fish but you have some organisms that can eat plants and animals and an example in this uh, graphic is the tundra swan because it's eating both vegetation here and it's also eating these bivalves or shellfish which are animals and you know, we don't always think of them as animals maybe we haven't stopped to think about it but they are animals so this tundra swan would be an example of an omnivore eats everything plants and animals okay so how is food energy used well food energy um, gets transferred as we know from plants to animals to other animals and it takes large quantities of organisms on one trophic level to support uh, the energy needs of the next trophic level and each level loses large amounts of energy it gathers through basic processes of living so we use a food pyramid to show that and in this food pyramid we can see that it takes an awful lot of uh, plant food energy to support uh, quite a few fewer herbivores and as you go up this food pyramid you'll see that the primary predators a fewer primary predators are supported by a larger number of herbivores until you get to the very top where you've got like the secondary predator uh, which would be um, like a, a secondary consumer or actually it would be a tertiary consumer and these guys you the the ecosystem can't support very many of them because it, it actually takes an awful lot of all of the levels below them, a lot, an awful lot of numbers of the levels below them uh, to be able to support them. That's because each time the energy flows from one trophic level to the next, quite a bit of energy is lost. 80-90% of the energy taken in by consumers is used in chemical reactions in the body and is lost as heat energy and that means that it doesn't get transferred to the next trophic level. So there's very little energy left, uh, left over for growth or to increase biomass as well. It's important to note that in a food pyramid, the producers determine how much life an ecosystem can contain. So at each level, uh, if we're losing 90% of the total energy available, we would need an awful lot of plants to support just a few animals. The lower tro trophic levels have much larger populations than the upper levels, so these herbivores in the ecosystem, we would find many more of them than these primary predators. And so one of the lessons to take away from this is that we need a lot of these organisms really at each level. Biodiversity is really important uh, in sort of maintaining balance in the ecosystem and um, ensuring that there is you know enough food energy for the organisms at the top of the food pyramid. Okay and that uh, wraps up that section on energy flow. Uh, hopefully that gives you a good starting point.